Hi folks, it's good to be with you today. We're doing an apologetics class uh, just for uh, a few minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, I don't know how long, but we're going to talk about uh, the minimal fact approach to defending the faith and what that entails. And I'm going to give Mike some pointers when he's debating at Hyde Park and give people some pointers about debating uh, Muslims at Hyde Park, okay? So I'm going to just ask Mike if he'll open in prayer and we'll get to the discussion. Father, we thank you today for this opportunity to, to um, talk about your word and your, and your son, our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for my brother Jason. I thank you for his friendship. I thank you for his, his wisdom and his knowledge. Lord, I just pray for the Holy Spirit to be present with us today, Lord, and to open, open us up more to the power and your resurrection. Of, so, Lord, I just ask that you just pour down your spirit on us today, Lord, as we, as we talk about your, your resurrection and the power of that resurrection today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, the first, first thing, uh, this is a, a paper by uh, Gary Habermas, which you can download, called The Minimal Facts of the Resurrection. And it says by Anthony Flew, who was an atheist at the time, he uh, died as a deist. He said, the evidence for the resurrection is better than for claimed miracles in any other relig religion. It is outstandingly different in quality and quantity. So what we're going to do now is just talk about what is the minimal fact approach to the resurrection. And then we're going to just discuss a few pointers around that and I'm just going to give Mike uh, a little bit of advice about how to debate concerning the minimal fact resurrection and anybody out there if, if you want to debate or discuss with people about it um, and then Mike if he wants to ask questions he can ask me some questions so basically the minimal fact approach it says here the the approach I will take in this paper is commonly referred to the minimal fact approach. This method considers only those data that are so strongly attested historically that they are granted by nearly every scholar who studies the subject, even the rather sceptical ones. So the minimal effect, uh, fact approach is saying here's what the scholarly world is saying on this topic of Jesus, the death and resurrection. These basic facts that we can verify by secular scholarship this is where we're basing our argument. So any any pointers on that, Mike? Any thoughts on that, or questions? Or... Yeah, um, what I found with a lot of people who deny the death and resurrection of Christ is yeah. they always say, oh, the empty tomb is, is not evidence enough to prove that there was a bodily resurrection. A lot of them claim the body was stolen, right. or it was taken away, and it was a big hoax to... But I asked them the question, why would anyone got to so much trouble to, to do such a thing if it wasn't you know if, why would they do that I just wanted to hear your thoughts on the, that well, kind of view well I think uh, one of the things about the minimal fact if you put this in your brain and if you put this in your head is the hypotheses that covers the facts yeah so say there are eight facts right yeah and your hypothesis is the body was stolen yeah. or Jesus was risen from the dead. If your hypothesis is Jesus risen from the dead and it fits the eight facts, yeah. but then the other person says, my hypothesis, the body was stolen, but it only fits three facts. Hmm. Yours is a stronger hypothesis because hmm. yours fits the eight facts. I see. So when they say the, the, tomb, the, the body's been stolen, all you've got to say, well, does what your view what facts does it verify hmm. yeah right so yeah. if it only verifies one or two facts you can say yeah but my hypothesis jesus rose from the dead fits all these facts hmm. yeah do you see what i mean so yeah. your your hypothesis is stronger so that's the first thing and second thing is to answer the specific detail well if the body was stolen there are certain things like there was so, there was a soldier outside and hmm. uh, if if that was the case uh, then you know he would have been killed. Yeah. Um, and there's no record of this. Mm. You know, so there are there are specific answers that you can give there. 
So you, you, you look at the compete, you look at, you, you like say, well, all right, your, your belief the body was stolen. So what, what facts do you actually, are you actually verifying? Yeah. Are you verifying Christ died? Yeah. And, and you'll find that their theory only fits two or three facts. Yeah. And so you say, well, my theory fits all of the facts. Yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. That's the beauty of the minimal fact yeah. approach, because any of you that comes against you can only fit one or two of the facts. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... It's like, um, if the body was stolen, why, did, why would they steal the body? Where was the body taken to? And why would all these disciples be martyred for the faith if it wasn't true? Yeah, and, and the other thing as well is... Uh, the Roman, the Romans and the Jews, they, they were preaching in Jerusalem. If they were preaching in Jerusalem uh, and they stolen, uh, stolen the body, then the Romans had captured them straight away and, and, and found them out and exposed them. Yeah. You know, so so they, why would you steal a body in Jerusalem and still go preaching in Jerusalem? Jesus is risen again. Yeah. You, you wouldn't do that because exactly. you just get exposed within five seconds, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, in, in the minimal facts approach, notice this one to five historical claims are strong when supported by multiple independent sources. Historical claims which are attested by enemies are more likely to be authentic since enemies are unsympathetic and often hostile witnesses. Historical claims which include embarrassing admissions reflect honest reporting rather than creating sto creative storytelling. Historical claims are strong when supported by eyewitness testimony. Historical claims are supported by early testimony are more reliable and less likely to be the result of legendary development. Good point, yeah. So, when you're doing the minimal facts approach, when you're in debate or when you're talking to people, you need to lay down what your criteria is. And this is where a lot of debaters, a lot of the public, will not have a clue about. Mm, yeah. So you should always ask your opponent when you're in debate, what's your criteria? Because if they haven't got it, like a criteria here, one yeah. is enemy attestation. Yeah, that's a good point. So enemy attestation is, if your enemy says something about you, it's probably true. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So you have Josephus says Jesus died yeah. under Pontius Pilate. He's an enemy, so it's probably true. Yeah. Right? So you should always pin your opponent down and ask them for the criteria. And if they haven't got a criteria, you kind of won the debate. You need to hold them down on that and say, well, what's the point of me giving you evidence or you arguing with me when you, you've not got a fair criteria? Yeah, exactly. You know? So always ask your opponents, what is your criteria? What, what, what method are you using? Yeah. And just a few caveats here, and this is a bit, a bit deep. But um, the minimal fact approach, and we could just discuss this a minute to tell me what you yeah, think. Yeah. The minimal fact approach presents its argument like this. We'll use secular scholars, and the secular scholars will show us that there are certain facts. These facts show that Jesus died and rose again. Now, do you see a problem with that? Can you see that there is a danger there which the minimal fact approach don't consider but is very important and the danger is this yeah is that every scholar throughout history Rainan, uh, Wise, um, Dominic Crossan every scholar is biased yeah so every scholar when they do historical Jesus studies and it's for any scholarship they'll have a certain amount of bias yeah right so no scholarship in historical Jesus studies or in any study is 100% pure objective. There's always some kind of bias. Of course there is, yeah. So when you're saying, I present these historical facts, uh, what the secular scholars say, you have a bias, the Muslim has a bias, the atheist has a bias. Yeah. Right? So if you're debating a Muslim, and they're saying, oh, I'm using secular scholars too. Hmm. Are they? Or are they using secular scholars, but they are biased with their Islam? Mm, yeah, that's good. You see point. what I'm going? Yeah, yeah. When you say I'm using secular scholars, yes, you are, but are you biased? Yeah, you're following the Bible. Mm, yeah. The on. atheist says I'm using secular scholars, yeah, but you're biased, you don't believe in God. That's the one, yeah, yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. So, 
always remember when you're doing the minimal fight approach that in its epistemology or theory of knowledge it's it, it's a little bit weak yeah right you've got to talk about your presuppositions your bias hmm yeah right my advice would be when you're in debate about the resurrection you need to say i know that i'm biased i i believe the bible you've got to admit your bias you believe the quran yeah but my bible is is more reliable for doing history than your quran yeah you've got contradictions in your quran correct right. and it's not historically accurate yeah my my gospels have been shown to be accurate yeah right so uh, it, it's important a, a lot of uh, debates on the resurrection don't go into into the um, the method hmm. right so the method what I'm telling you to do or con encouraging you to do if you if, if you just go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 well I'll tell you what if you just go to 1 Corinthians 15 I'll just show you I'll give you an example that's the one Paul Rose has been using All right. to try and dispute the resurrection. Alright, we'll go to 1 Corinthians 15. We'll go into that in a minute. Yeah, it's amazing that. All right? 1 Corinthians 15, right? We're just talking about uh, apologetic method now. This is what we're talking about just for a minute. Yeah, alright. All right. So the minimal fact approach is looking at it, it's looking at it evidentially. Yeah. There's evidence, yeah? So it says in 1 Corinthians 15, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which you also have received, wherein you stand, by which you are, are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. For I delivered unto you, verse 3, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. And that he was set, seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, and then he was seen above five hundred, etc. Now, the minimal fact approach uses this passage, and it's good. He says there, if you look at it, it says, verse 3, For I delivered unto you. Now, the minimal fact approach will point out that a lot of scholars, academic scholars, yeah. see that word delivered as a rabbinic term, and the rabbis... Yeah. used to get the disciples to repeat verbatim what they said yeah. so that they passed it on to the next generation yeah. and it had to be accurate. So they know, scholars know, that the word I delivered is a rabbinic term and so they've concluded yeah. that this information Paul's talking about the resurrection goes within t two years of the death and resurrection of Christ. Wow. Because of that one word. I delivered, yeah. Right, because it's a rabbinic term yeah. from the time of Jesus. And what does it mean again? Sorry, it it, it it's a rabbinic term of re where people were told to re repeat. Yeah. Uh, Basically, what being told. Or, oral tradition. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. Before the disciples. Wow. So the disciples of the rabbis would say, right, would they get a student to stand up? Yeah. And then the student would have to say, what I have deli what I have, what I've received, I delivered. The, the word here. Yeah. Right? For I have delivered unto that which I have received. So the word delivered and received are rabbinic terms. Oh, wow. Right? So the students would get up and they repeat these words yeah. and then the oral tradition. And it had to be accurate, absolutely accurate. And the scholars have worked out that this is a tradition of what Paul is saying that goes back within two years of the death and resurrection. And it's so solid, this evidence yeah. that if anybody tries to attack it, it just falls to the ground because modern scholarship has come to this conclusion. Wow. Right? Now the point is, that is a minimal fact argument. Yeah. That's from data and evidence, right? Yeah. But that's that's evidence. Now... Just knock that Bluetooth off. Now that's evidence. Now let's just look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. One Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10. 
you could read that and tell me the what the evidence that we've looked at there if we were talking to a Muslim or an atheist what the problem would be even though we've got this evidence yeah from verse 10 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 10 but God has revealed them to us through his spirit for the spirit it searches all things yes the deep things of God for what man knows the thing of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him even so no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God now we have received not the spirit of the world but the spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God keep going to, to 14 these things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So what does that tell you? Here's the minimal of fact approach. They're saying you've got to give evidence, which is right. Yeah. But what does this passage tell you? You give your evidence to the Muslim, what's this saying? When you're giving your evidence to the Muslim... It's saying that if he doesn't receive it and, and take it on board or accept it, then it's saying here that the, the passage is saying he's not, he hasn't got the Spirit of God in him. That's it. He's Verse not discerned, is he, with spiritual things? First of all, that's it. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness Foolish. unto him. Yeah. Right? Neither can they know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So when you give your evidence to the Muslim or anybody, yeah. they've got yellow glasses on mm. and they'll look at the world from yellow glasses. Yeah. You've got your blue Christian glasses on, you're looking at it from a blue Christian perspective. Until they put the blue glasses on, yeah. that evidence you've given them, they're never going to see. Yeah, that's you true. See, that, you see? Yeah. So you have to not only give evidence, but you have to uh, go to their foundation of what is blinding them. What is it? So you have to go to the Quran or go to the atheist and say, your Quran is stopping you from seeing the truth here. Yeah. That is your glass. Yeah. That is the, what is causing you spiritual darkness. Yeah. So not only do you give your evidence, you have to tackle the blindness in the glasses, the things that they're looking at the evidence with. Mm, yeah, that's true. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, because if you just keep giving them evidence and they keep disputing it, all it does is reinforce this bit of scripture. So we need to show them that and say, this is why yeah. you're not receiving it. So, so you give them the evidence. So if you're debating a Muslim, you give them the evidence of the minimal facts. Yeah. But then you say, but you're, look you're not looking at this objectively. You're looking at it from your Quran. Yeah. And they might turn around and say, yeah, but you're looking at it from the, the Bible. But you can say, yeah, I admit that I'm biased, but you need to know your bias. Everybody's biased. Yeah. But... I am using secular scholarship here, and the evidence does point to, but, and I'm trying to minimise my bias, but my bias is worthy of bias because the books that I'm using, the Gospels and, and this source here, yeah. have been proven to be accurate, but your Quran has never been proved to be accurate Correct. about historical sources. Do you yeah. see what I'm getting at? Yeah, yeah. You need to push them and say, you're not objective, and your Quran is not able to give us, give you objectivity to help you to study these topics. Exactly, it's true that, and it's not, it's, it's not clear, is it, on things? It's confusing. So, so minimal facts is evidential. What I've just taught you there is presuppositional apologetics. Yeah. And you need the both. You need to give evidence. That's minimal fact, but you need to tackle presuppositions. Yeah. Things that are what their glasses are, what they're looking at the evidence from. Yeah, correct. All right. And a lot of debates, when people are debating, uh, they either go one side or the other. And in minimal fact debates, they, they don't tackle the presuppositions. And you need to tackle both. Yeah, to get them. All right. Yeah, it's good. So, so then we'll go to fact one. The death of Jesus by crucifixion. This is the minimal fact approach. Yeah. Perhaps no other facts surrounding the life of the historical Jesus. Just get rid of it. It's Sorry. a sales call. Yeah. Sorry, I'm listening, bro. Alright. The death of Jesus by a crucifixion. Perhaps no other facts surrounding the life of the historical Jesus 
is better attested than his death by crucifixion. Not only is the crucifixion account included in every possible narrative, every gospel narrative, but it is also confirmed by several non-Christian sources. These include the Jewish historian Josephus, the Roman historian Tacitus, the Greek satirist Lucian of Samorta, as well as the Jewish Talmud. Mm. Josephus tells us that Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, condemned him to the cross. From a perspective of historiography, Jesus' crucifixion meets the historical criteria of multiple independent early eyewitness sources, including enemy attestation. John Dominic Crossan, a non-Christian scholar and co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, states that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical fact, uh, any historical can ever be. So here, if you notice, we have multiple lines of evidence using multiple lines of criteria, enemy, enemy attestation, eyewitnesses, all verified that, that Christ died. So any thoughts about that? And now, just that, that's absolutely brilliant. That is just minimal. That's just the minimal facts that he's stating, and there's more to it. If we if we got really into the crux of looking at the writings of Josephus and the Jewish Talmud, that adds even more weight to it. So the evidence just keeps building yeah, with yeah. regards to it. You know, even if they reject the minimal facts, people who are against that, the position that we've got, we can just expand more and more, and it just gets stronger every time. And I think it's fantastic uh, doing this. Stuff. So, so that when you when you present your evidence, all you need to do is read a quote from Josephus or or uh, Tacitus, and then just say, look, there's multiple lines of evidence that Jesus. Died, and here's the point when you're debating specifically Muslims is the Muslims in the Quran believe that Jesus wasn't crucified, yet there is no scholar worthy of their soul. The, the, uh, the only academic scholars who would say Jesus didn't die on a cross are either Muslims hmm. or crackpot internet atheists, yeah, right? Yeah. But your average, decent ordinary scholar in the academic world, 99.9% .9 believe Jesus was crucified. And it's essential to the Christian faith. This is the foundation of our faith, is Christ crucified, his death, his resurrection. The Paul says if, if Christ is not crucified, then we're the worst to be pitied, but Christ did rise from the dead. Amen. So, so in debate, if you were yeah. debating Paul Williams or if you're debating any Muslim, you have to hit them over the head with that and say, this position that you're taking, the academic world does not accept. The academic world accepts Jesus died on the cross. Yeah. And, 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 and it's fair to say that. It's not an argument from authority. Argument from authority is saying the academic world says. Yeah. Right? But you're saying the academic world says, and here's the evidence. Backed up by the evidence. Backed up the evidence. So that's not an argument from authority because you've got the evidence, you see. Yeah. Right? Exactly. So, and that is our strong point against the Quran. Yeah. So it needs to be rammed on. That if you've got a strong point, you don't just mention it in a debate. You keep ramming it home in a debate. Yeah. You keep saying, or in a discussion with a Muslim, you keep bringing this up that there's lots of evidence. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're talking about how to defend in debate situations on campuses, universities, and at Hyde Park in any. Uh, debate or discussion group at, a, at an academic setting in university, college or school or at, um, or at Hyde Park or somewhere. This is what we're talking about. Or even if you're witnessing to, to your fellow Muslim or atheist friends, this is a strong point that we have solid academic and primary sources that Christ died. So we should, we should yeah. ram that all. Yeah, and the Quran makes a claim about the Christian faith, but offers no evidence to prove it. It, it offers many theories, but it cannot back up a single passage of its scripture against what the Bible teaches. Mm -hmm. uh, Muslims say, well, the Quran must be true because it's, because it's written, because Muhammad received revelation. Is that all you've got? Yeah. Is that so, all you've got? So there's no evidence to back up this, you know, and the other thing you can ask a Muslim is who, if you're saying Jesus didn't die on a cross, who did? Yeah, they reckon it was someone else. Someone else took the place of Jesus and everyone was filled thinking it was Jesus. But 
Mary, his mother, was at the foot of the cross and she would have known the difference between an imposter and her own son. But the Muslims say God mm, mm. deceived people. So God is now the um, inventor of the world's greatest false religion, according to Islam. And the fact is, it goes against your own Quran, which says no one shall bear the burden of another. No one shall bear the, the sins or the burden of another. So if someone else has took the place of Jesus, that means an innocent man has been crucified. Mm, which mm. goes against your own teachings. Mm. That's a good one, that bro. Um, objection one, the swoon fiendry. Some skeptics argue that Jesus may have been crucified, but he did not, did not actually die. Instead, he lost consciousness, swooned, and merely appeared to be dead, only to later be revived in the cool, damp tomb in which he was laid. After reviving, he made his way out of the tomb and presented himself to his disciples as the resurrected Messiah. Thus the Christian religion begins. This theory is problematic for several reasons. First, the swoon theory does not take seriously what we know about the horrendous scourging and torture associated with the crucifixion. As an expert team from the Journal of the American Medical Association concludes, accordingly, quote, accordingly interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Second, Jesus faking his own resurrection goes against every, everything we know about his ethical ministry. And third, a half-dead, half-resurrected Messiah could hardly serve as the foundation for the disciples' belief in the resurrection. German theologian David Frederick Strauss, he was a sceptic, yeah. explains, it is impossible that a being who had stolen uh, uh, who had stolen half dead out of the sepulchre, who crept about weak and ill, wanted medical treatment, who requiring bandaging, strengthening and indulgence, and who still had at least yielded to his sufferings, could have given to the disciples the impression that he was a conqueror of death and the grave, the prince of life, an impression which lay at the bottom of their future ministry. Such a resuscitation could only have weakened the impression which had made upon them in life and in death, at the most could only have given an angelic, eh, I can't, I can't pronounce that. Elegate voice. Elegate voice, but could by no possibility have changed their sorrow into enthusiasm and elevated their reverence into worship. So if you're saying that he didn't die, he was put in the empty tomb, he was put in the tomb, half emaciated, you're saying he got up, went to see Peter, and said he's risen again, and we're supposed to believe that the disciples looking at the emaciated Jesus would then start preaching he's risen again. That doesn't make sense, does yeah. it? Yeah, and the, and the teachings of the apostles after Christ's death is that he died and rose again. As Paul said in Corinthians, yeah. he, was, he died and he rose again and was buried according to the scriptures. Yeah. And the Bible says that all scripture is God breathed. Every word that God proceeds out of the mouth of God is living, is living bread, that gives us life. So the word of God is a lot, is true. Mm, mm. You know the Bible has got over three hundred prophecies in it. Archaeology proves the Bible. The evidence for the Bible is far greater than Islam, uh, Mormonism, or any other false religion out there that claims mm. some kind of truth. Amen. Pilate said, "What is truth? What is truth? I'll tell you what truth is. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life." Mm -hmm. And people need to know that the only truth is Jesus Christ. Amen. Only truth. Amen. That's good stuff, bro. Fourth, this theory is an anachronistic in postulating that the disciples, upon seeing Jesus in his half uh, com comatose, comatose state. state, would be led to conclude that he had been raised from the dead within history, in opposition to the Jewish belief in one final resurrection at the end of time. On the contrary, seeing him again would lead them to conclude he didn't die. So, in other words, him just turned. It was expected a resurrection at the end of time. Mm. So, if they'd have seen him just turn up like that, they wouldn't have believed it. Unless they'd have seen it with their own eyes, they wouldn't have believed it. Yeah, and the Bible says we live by faith, not by sight. And it's Jesus says, "Blessed are those who believe who have not seen." Amen. Fifth, Roman soldiers were professional executor, executioners, and everything we know about the torture and crucifixion of Jesus confirms his death, making this theory physically impossible. Yeah. Sixth, no early evidence or testimony exists claiming Jesus was merely wounded. All the evidence we have is he was killed. Finally, 
This theory cannot account for the conversion of the skeptics like Paul, also testified to having seen the risen Lord and willing suffered and died for his belief in the resurrection. Another point as well is when the Roman soldiers crucified someone, what they did with Christ, they had a spear and they dug it into his side. That was to make sure he was dead. Mm. So they pierced his side and out of the side came water and blood. And that shows that the heart, the chambers of his heart were filled with fluid that just mm. built up the mm. pressure of crucifixion. So that demonstrates he was dead. Mm. No one would survive that. You know, the amount of pressure on the heart and the mm. body. Amen. And that, and that, what Maestro said, refutes the Quran totally and utterly. So. Yeah. Fact number two, the empty tomb. Something happened to the body of Jesus, on this we can be sure. Not only was Jesus publicly executed in Jerusalem, but his post-mortem appearances in empty tomb were first publicly proclaimed there. This would have been impossible with a decaying corpse still in the tomb. It would have been wholly un-Jewish, notes William Craig, not to say foolish to believe that a man was raised from the dead when his body was still in the grave. The Jewish authorities had plenty of motivation to produce a body and silence these men who turned the world upside down, effectively ending the Christian religion for good. But no one could. The early, the early opposing theory recorded by the enemies of Christianity is that the disciples stole the body. Ironically, this presupposes the empty tomb. In addition, all four gospel narrators attest to the burial of Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea and place a woman as the primary witness to the empty tomb. Both of these are highly unlikely to be Christian inventions. First, with regard to Joseph of Arimathea, Bible scholar J. D. Dunn said, is a very plausible historical character. He is attested in all four gospels. This is Joseph of Arimathea, who yeah. buried Jesus, is a very plausible historical character. He is attested in all four Gospels and in the Gospel of Peter, when the tendency of the tradition was to shift the blame to the Jewish council. The creation ex nihilo of a sympathizer from among their number would be surprising, and Arimathea, a town very difficult to identify and reminiscent of no scriptural symbolism, makes a thesis of invention even more implausible. Atheist Jeffrey Lauder agrees that the burial of Jesus by Joseph of Arimathea has a high final probability. Second, just as unlikely to be invented, is the report of woman followers discovering the empty tomb, especially when considering the low status of woman in both Jewish and Roman culture, and their inability to testify as legal witnesses. If the empty tomb account were a fabricated story intended to persuade skeptics, it would have been better served by including male disciples as primary witnesses. Yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah, it's it's actually Bob on all the everything is ticking boxes, the dots are being joined and the pieces are fitting perfectly into what the Bible teaches. It's it's woven perfectly into the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And anyone who comes against it is just placing their theories on, not on facts, but on their own in mindful embellishments which don't stand up to scrutiny. Yeah. So, yeah. if you do don't believe in the resurrection, burial of Jesus Christ, I suggest that you do an honest research and you will come to the conclusions that he did rise from the dead. Amen. Amen. Objection 2. The disciples stole the body of fraud conspiracy. As mentioned above, the early record polemic against the empty tomb is the charge by Jewish authorities that the disciples stole the body. This is really commonly referred to as the fraud or conspiracy theory. Number one, first this theory does not explain well the simplicity of the resurrection narratives, nor why the disciples would invent woman as the primary witness to the empty tomb. This is hardly the way one gets conspiracy theory off the ground. Two, second, this also does not, does not explain why the disciples would perpetuate a story that they stole the body, Matthew 28, 11, 15, if in fact they stole the body. Yeah. Propagating an explanation which incriminates oneself is against at odds with a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Third, 
As will be discussed below, this theory does not account for the fact that the disciples of Jesus had genuine experiences in which they believed they saw the risen Christ. So convinced were these men that their lives were transformed into committing, committed followers willing to suffer and die for their belief. Liars make poor martyrs. Fourth, this theory runs opposite to everything we know about the disciples. J.N.D. Anderson states, This would run totally contrary to all we know of them, their ethical teaching, quality of their lives, their steadfastness in suffering and persecution, nor would it begin to explain the dramatic transformation from rejected and dispirited escapists into witnessing whom no opposition could muddle. Fifth, this theory is incomplete and anachronistic. There was no expectation by the first century Jews of a suffering servant Messiah who would be shamefully executed by the Gentiles as a criminal only to rise again bodily before the final resurrection at the end of time. As Wright nicely puts it, N.T. Wright, if your favourite Messiah got himself crucified, then you either went home or else you got yourself a new Messiah. But the idea of stealing Jesus' corpse and saying that God had raised him from the dead is hardly one that would have entered the minds of his disciples. Finally, this theory can account, cannot account for the conversion of sceptics like Paul. Plus as well, in the Old Testament, I think it's Isaiah 53, talks about um, Jesus, doesn't name him, but when you read the account, it says he was buried in a rich man's tomb, which we read in the New Testament. Jesus was assigned a grave of the rich in a mm. rich man's tomb. Yeah. Uh, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was wounded. He was pierced and it talks about him suffering and it all everything you read in the Old Testament fits nicely to what is revealed in the New Testament. So you got you you've got your you've got your revelation. So you've got your um, what's it called now when uh, oh, I can't think of the word. Um, crucifixion. It's when resurrection. God when it reveals something prior to it happening. What's it called that? Uh, prior, prior to it happening. Yeah, there's uh, a word for it. I can't think of it. Um, theophany, not theophany. Um, a type, a type of Christ, or it's like that. Yeah, it's it's a prophecy. Sorry, so it was prophesied in the Old Testament. Do you mm. about? I know. It, it, and then you see the fulfilment in the New. That's what. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 there, there are kind of pictures of Christ that are given. imagery. There's imagery. Yeah, and it kind of points to what's going to happen in the future. Yeah, and there's a lot of imagery in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. The church, a lot of ch priest, uh, preachers talk about imagery. It's very powerful, is the imagery. Yeah, and there's, yeah. It's all there. It's all in here, and it's all outside of here as well. And um, yes. Go on. Have you, go so on. if you're if you if you're an honest if you're honest, you will not take the Quran view about it. So so what you're saying is. Uh, the Quran says certain things about Jesus, but what you're saying is, before even the Quran, we had the Old Testament, and right. in the Old Testament, there are all these prophecies and types of the death and resurrection of Christ. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So, like in 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 Isaiah fifty three, as the if you read that, it has the crucifixion of Christ, but it also has the resurrection. There, it talks about he will see his seed. That's right. Yeah. You know, so he will not taste death. Not yet. Yeah. So. So that's what you're saying in it, and that if you in honestly investigate that, then you'll find the truth in the Old Testament pointing to Jesus, whereas the Quran doesn't do that. Now, what we read here, if you notice, and this is really important, uh, we've quoted scholars like N. T. Wright, we've quoted scholars like Dunn, mm -hmm. right? Now, if you read many of these scholars, uh, as now, now um, N.T. Wright's a, a Christian scholar, but if you read many of these uh, scholars, like, and this is a very important point if you're using the minimal fact, right? Yeah. If you use Dominic Crossan, yeah. if you use N.T. Wright, if you use uh, Dale Allison, um, uh, Mayer, yeah. uh, who's a great uh, Catholic uh, scholar on these topics, you read all these, they have critical tools of modern scholarship, hmm. right? And these critical tools tear the, part, the Bible apart, Yeah. right? So your opponent will say, ah, 
you're using these critical scholars, but they wouldn't agree with you on the inerrancy of the Bible. Mm. Right? So you've got to be aware that that objection will come to you. Yeah. Right? So the way to, to mount that point is just to say, well, I'm aware of that, but we're talking about the death and resurrection of Christ. And we can say that these critical scholars do come to some conclusions. One is that Christ died, and two, that Jesus, that the disciples believe Jesus rose again. Yeah. And this is another important point. Your opponent will say, your Muslim opponent and your atheist opponent mm. will say, yeah, the scholars believe that Christ died, yeah. but they don't all believe that he rose again physically. Ah, uh, yeah, that's true. Right? So... You're saying all these scholars agree with you, but the scholars say that Christ died. Yeah, but they don't actually believe that he rose again. But this is what you can say. Well, of course, but one thing that you're forgetting is that all the scholars, because some of them don't believe he rose again, not because of the evidence, it's because they're anti-supernaturalists. They don't believe in a God. They don't believe in miracles. So they're never going to accept that he rose from the dead. Yeah. But all the scholars, the vast majority, do agree with this, that the disciples believed in a resurrection. Correct, yeah. Preached a resurrection. Yeah. And if you get that, then it's up to them to believe the disciples' testimony. Correct. Right? So whichever way they come at you, they will point out to you that you're cherry-picking. Of course so, yeah. And then you need to turn around to them and say, but you're cherry picking because when the Muslims are using scholars like Paul Williams, yeah, they are mega, 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 mega cherry picking. Of course, they are. You know. Plus, as well, most of the scholars the Muslims quote against Christianity were against Islam. <laughs> That's the other point. <laughs> yeah. When Paul Williams and Hamza and all these Muslim apologists that I part quote Christian scholars like Bart Ehrman, Bart Ehrman doesn't believe that doesn't believe in the Quran. When the Quran says Jesus did not die, <laughs> but Ehrman believes categorically he's written a book about the historical Jesus. Yeah. And in that book, he categorically states that Christ died. And Mexico does as well. Bruce Mexico believes in it. That means that, that refutes Islam totally. He doesn't believe Islam. Yeah, and, and, and the darling of the Muslims, the, 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 be the, the one that they love the most is either Bart Ehrman or Bruce Metzer. Yeah. But Bruce Metzer believed in the death and resurrection of Christ. Yeah. So it's not good quoting him on textual criticism because he believed that Jesus died and rose again. Okay? Yeah. And the thing is, when you're quoting him on textual criticism, just on the, on, the, on the side to the Muslims, you're only quoting him out of context. You're not getting him in context. Yeah. But he did believe in the death and resurrection. And Bart Ehrman believed that Christ died. Mm. All right? So when you start quoting Bart Ehrman and all these scholars, they don't agree with the Quran when it comes to the basic historical information about who Jesus is. You might say, well, the Quran says that Jesus is a prophet and modern scholarship says Jesus is a prophet, but even that that Jesus is a prophet you got from the Bible. Yeah. You know, so you're not in touch as as Islam is not in touch with modern scholarship when it comes to the historical Jesus and the death and resurrection. Correct. The, the so but far behind and so out of touch, it's embarrassing and it's quite sad really. It is, yeah. All right. So they'll quote all these verses, all these scholars like Paul Williams will quote Muslim scholars, but they're just cherry picking yeah. and they don't agree with them on the foundation of the crucifixion. Exactly. Another thing Paul Williams does as well, he quotes the Bible as if he knows it and he doesn't, he says in 1 Corinthians that Christ was d died, rose from the dead, was buried. And Paul Williams says, where does it say that in the Jewish scriptures? Where does it say that in the Old Testament? I just want to remind you, Paul Williams, that when it says according to the scriptures, we believe that the Old and the New Testament are the scriptures. And it says in the scriptures that Christ died and was rose from the dead. Mm. So to say that we need to go to the Old Testament to look at a passage that is clear to what what Paul is saying is completely false. We just use the scriptures, which is all scripture is God breathed, my friend. So we don't go to the Old Testament to answer your question. We go to, we use the whole body of the Bible, which is scripture, by the way. Mm. That's the point I want to make on Paul Williams. All right. We, um, use, we use all, all of scripture. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, now we go to the post-resurrection appearance. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8, Paul recounts what biblical scholars recognise as an early Christian creed dating within a few years of the crucifixion. Wow. Notice the creedal nature, repetitive structure of this passage. For I deliver to you as a first importance what I have received, in which also you stand, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, after and that he appeared to more than five hundred brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Included in this creed are three of our minimal facts, the death of Jesus, the empty tomb, and the post-resurrection appearances. Furthermore, our fourth minimal fact, the origin of Christianity, is easily explained given the first three facts. Paul not only mentions the multiple post-resurrection appearances, but includes himself as having seen the risen Lord. Several indicators in the next confirm that in, in in the text confirm this to be an early Christian creed. So it's not only got rabbinic terms in it that mm -hmm. can be traced to within two years. There's also a creed, an early creed that can be traced. Uh, wow in the first few years of and this is doing using secular scholarship has verified this could you get me a copy of this you'll have to um just write that i'll write it down because I'll, I'll i'll get that myself as well it's uh get a pen. yeah I've, i'll write it down right i'll get it oh, down. Yeah, yeah. i'll get it i'll get it you can they can get it down we'll write it down in a minute yeah so First, as shown above, the passage uses stylized words, parallel structure, common to creedal formula. Second, the word delivered and received are technical terms, including a rabbinic heritage in view. Third, the phrases, he was raised, third day, twelve, are unusual Pauline terms, making this unlikely to have originated, uh, sorry, uh, unusual Pauline terms, making it this unlikely to have originated with Paul himself, so it's come from an earlier source. Yeah. Fourth, the Aramaic term Cephas is used for Peter, indicating an extremely early origin. New Testament scholar and skeptic Gerd Ludemann assigns this passage as very early date, date stating. The elements in the tradition are to be dated to the first two years after the crucifixion of Jesus, not later than three years. The formation of the appearance tradition mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, 3-8 falls into this time between 30 to 33 AD. Gert Ludemann is a, a, a well-known atheist scholar. Wow. And he's confirming that this source is within two years of the death and resurrection of and Christ. And it just blows away anything the Quran has to say, doesn't it? Yeah. Wow. So do you see the beauty of the minimal fact? Because you're yeah. using atheist scholars, you're using scholars that are against you, who are agreeing with you on... And these are biased sources as well. These are biased sources, yeah. yet they're agreeing with you yeah. on the death and resurrection of Christ. Exactly, yeah. The early date of this creed rules out the possibility of myth or legendary development as a plausible explanation and demonstrates that the disciples began proclaiming Jesus' death, resurrection and post-resurrection appearances very early. Christian philosopher and theologian J.P. Morland elaborates, there was simply not enough time for a great deal of myth and legend to accrue and distort the historical facts in any significant way. In this regard, A.N. Sherman White, a scholar of ancient Roman and Greek history at Oxford, has studied the rate at which legend accumulates in the ancient world. Using the writings of Herodotus, as test case, he argues that even a span of two generations is not sufficient for legend to wipe out a solid core of historical facts. The picture of Jesus in the New Testament was established well within that length of time. Wow. Again, Ludeman acknowledges, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. 
There is no dispute amongst the scholars that the disciples experienced something. Correct. Yeah. And this is from a skeptic. This is from Gert Ludemann, an atheist. Wow. Uh, and a very eminent uh, atheist scholar. He's, what, he's, he's not your internet guy. He, he's like cutting edge. Could we do this with the Quran and scrutinise it in such a way and come to a conclusion that this that the Quran has got some kind of foundational source? I'll conclude no. What would you say on that, Joe? It, it can't even be compared to it. The, the Quran be. makes certain statements about Jesus that he did not die and that someone else died in his place. That's a certain statement, but there is absolutely no certain facts to deal with that. Yeah. And any there's no scholar of any repute that takes this seriously. Mm. But when we go into the scholarship of what the Bible's saying, we're getting, not only are we getting primary sources, we're getting also top scholars who are against us, who, who attack the Bible, but actually coming down and saying, actually, you know what? There's facts to prove he died. There's facts to prove that there was an empty tomb. There's facts to prove that yeah. the disciples did preach and believe in a resurrection. Correct. And just to let you know, Muslims, um, we as Christians do not accept the Quran because it was written 600 years later, 600 miles away, by one man claiming to receive revelation. There was no witnesses to this so-called encounter with Muhammad in the cave. Mm. And there was no witnesses to any of the miracles that you claim Muhammad did, like, for example, sp splitting the moon. There's no evidence of that. There's no evidence that he went on a winged horse to Jerusalem or into heaven. Mm. There's nothing. <coughs> and That's everything a good point, the, bro. Yeah. Everything the Quran teaches is to... When I read the Quran, it, it doesn't teach me anything about God or it gives me anything that <coughs> I can say that is a final revelation to man. Basically, to me, it's just an answer to Judaism and Christian beliefs and the very distorted... And it's written by someone who has no knowledge, no understanding of who God is. Amen. And has come, has made an he's he's made a false god in his own image, and it's not the true living God which the Bible talks about. A God of mercy, a God of love, a God that doesn't want to destroy its creation, doesn't want to do anything that's evil, but a God that is good and righteous. Amen. Amen. So we're going to finish now. Uh, the article that we're reading from is uh, it, it it's using uh, Gary Habermas's material. Yeah. But it's by, it's the minimal fact of the resurrection written by Aaron Brake. Aaron Brake, A-A-R-O-N-B-R-A-K-E. Minimal fact of the resurrection written by Aaron Brake. So you can get this material from his article. Just Google uh, minimal fact of the resurrection, Aaron Brake, it'll come up. And you can read the article, you can download the article. So we've just re read about a half or a quarter of this article. We're going to finish now. You can go and take up the reading of this article and study it yourself. So we're just at, we, what we've done today is we've just looked at the, some minimal facts of the resurrection using the minimal fact approach. We've looked at the strengths of the minimal fact approach, yeah. but then we've considered a possible weaknesses. And just a few debate pointers if you're in debate and discussion. When you debate the resurrection, do you know from a Muslim or from an atheist perspective the two biggest attacks they use against the resurrection? No. I don't right. Know. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the two main bigger attacks and how you can deal with them. The first big attack is Mithraism. Oh, you alright? Yeah. Sales call. Alright. The first big attack that the Muslims and the atheists will use is Mithraism. Yeah. And what they will say is... You alright? Yeah, power out off now. Alright. All right. What they will say is that this dying and rising is part of ancient religions, that there were these ancient religions yeah. of Mithraism that believed in dying and rising gods like Thorus and others. Yeah. Alright? And so therefore, it's not historical, it's just taken from these other ancient religions called Mithraism. Yeah. Right? So the way to deal with Mithraism is Mithraism, we have no ancient text, you know, like a text oh, yeah. of this religion. Right? Yeah. 
all the information that they get is looking at archaeology such as um, like cows and, and stones. Yeah. Right? There's no written information. Right? Secondly, Mithraism is over 1,000 years of history from round about 500 BC yeah. round up to about 400 AD. Yeah. Mithraism at the time in, in, Gre in Greece in 500 AD is not the same as Mithraism of, of, uh, of say 200 BC in Persia. Oh, yeah. So in other words, when they say there are these dying and rising gods, we have no text, so you see, you say, well, give us a text. Yeah. Read us a text. Right? They haven't got the text. Number two, Mithraism is a, a very complex religion of many diverse religions over a thousand years, and they're not the same. There's no one pattern. Yeah. So to say it's dying and rising gods is just, is just uh, anti-scholarship, right? Yeah. But third... That any of these ancient texts, there's nothing, I've read many of them, yeah. there's nothing of dying and rising. So mm -hmm. there'll be one God that goes down to Hades, yeah. okay, and has sex with some other God and comes back. Yeah. And he's born a different kind of God. Yeah. And they'll say, so when they're saying dying and rising gods, that's what they're on about. Oh, I see, yeah, yeah. So it's, so it's not dying and rising God, it's just, they're just making it up. Yeah. Doesn't fit in with what doesn't we fit, believe. It doesn't fit in. Yeah. You see, the, 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 uh, and then fourthly, modern scholarship doesn't take this argument seriously from historical Jesus studies. The reason is what, what the Muslim and the atheist are doing and Mithraist, they're reading Christianity, dying and rising, they're reading that as a hermeneutic, and going back into ancient religions yeah. and fitting it onto ancient texts yeah. or ancient, not not just texts, but ancient um, um, beliefs. Beliefs. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. So modern scholars don't take it seriously. Hmm. And the guy who who propagated this recently, a uh, uh, Dr. Wells, a German scholar, uh, in who was a scholar in German, he wasn't a scholar in historical Jesus studies. But he's the one who pushed it recently in the middle of the 20th century. He's abandoned it. He doesn't believe it anymore. And he's the one who, who propagated it yeah. in the 20th century. So Mithraism, it can't be defended. And then the, the, the next big thing in debate, if you're debating people uh, at Hyde Park or anywhere on campus, is Bible contradictions. They, Bart Ehrman will show you lots of contradictions, so-called, in the Gospels. Mm. Right? So how do you deal with these so-called contradictions? Well, the first one is to talk about plausibility structure. Mm. Every theory that is r relatively true, 